Thank you for a kind introduction. And first, I'd like to thank the uh, legal organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, nice workshop. So this is my first, no, no, the second visit to, at KAIST. So I, I really enjoy uh, my stay here again. So today I'd like to talk about uh, the approximation problem of four, uh, intermediate vector boson model at low energy by the four fermion interaction model uh, for the weak interaction of uh, elementary particles. So we consider two systems. Uh, one is uh, the Dirac, Dirac Proca equations. A uh, Dirac equation is I times gamma mu times D mu psi is equal to one half gamma mu times A mu I minus gamma phi psi. Uh, Greek indices run from zero to three and uh, uh, Latin indices run from one to three. Indices repeated like this are summed. Uh, this is the uh, Einstein convention. The Proca equation is uh, the massive Maxwell equations like this. This angle bracket denote uh, the scalar product of the four-dimensional complex space. So gamma mu is a so-called Dirac matrices, and we impose uh, initial condition here. Another system is the nonlinear Dirac equation with cubic nonlinearity. Here, uh, chapter M denotes the mass of the, the field of Proca. Chapter I uh, denotes four by four identity matrix and uh, gamma mu uh, four, four by four matrices satisfying uh, these anti-commutation relations. Gamma mu times gamma mu plus gamma mu times gamma mu is equal to twice g mu nu i. G mu nu uh, denotes uh, the flat Minkowski metric such that the diagonal components uh, one minus one minus one minus one and the off diagonal components uh, vanishes. That is zero. And matrix gamma five uh, is defined as I times gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. We use uh, notation T for a variable X naught and D sub mu denotes the partial differentiation in X mu variable. <coughs> Indices uh, are raised and lowered using this metric uh, G menu and its inverse. So, uh, psi uh, is a C4 valued function which denotes uh, the field of Dirac. AMU uh, are real valued functions representing vectors in R21 plus 3. The function psi denotes the field of massless fermion with spin 1 half. <laughs> but you can also consider a massive fermion. But it doesn't matter in my talk. The functions mu denotes the field of massive boson with spin one. The system of uh, the Dirac Proca equations appears in the intermediate vector boson model for the weak interaction of elementary particles before the adoption of the unified theory of electron weak interactions. Dirac equation 
five is a uh, uh, have the cubic nonlinearity, which correspond to the four fermion interaction, so called uh, Fermi theory. If the mass m of the intermediate vector boson is sufficiently large, or the energy of the boson is small relatively to the scaled mass m scaled mass, one may think that the system of the Dirac Proca equation is well approximated by cubic nonlinear Dirac equation five. This is uh, this is described uh, in the introductory book of elementary particles. So the Fermi theory gives an excellent description of four fermion coupling phenomena involving the weak interaction at low energy, such as the beta decay of a neutron into a proton, an electron, and an electron anti-neutrino. Ah, sorry, I'm <laughs> figure that disappears. I'm yes. <laughs> so uh, this. Yes, the beta decays uh, is a, a phenomenon like this, and decomposes uh, into uh, proton, uh, electron, and electron anti neutrino. So, this beta decay is induced by a weak boson, uh, which is denoted by uh, the Proca equation. But uh, if the mass of the weak boson is sufficiently large, uh, the uh, weak interaction can be regarded as a point-like interaction of four fermions. That is called a four fermion approximation of four fermion interaction. The aim of my talk today is just to justify this approximation of the intermediate vector boson model at low energy by the four fermion interaction in a mathematically legal sense. Before stating the main result, I would like to mention a, a remark about uh, the gauge of the Proca equation. Remark one. The mass term fixes the gauge. That is, the Proca equation must satisfy the Lorentz gauge. So, in this respect, the Proca equation is different from the Maxwell equation. The Maxwell equation uh, has uh, the lot of freedom of gauge. So, more specifically, if Psi and uh, N you satisfy equation one. Equation one uh, is the Dirac equation interacting with the uh, uh, Proca field. Then it is easily verified that equation two, that is the Proca equation, is equi equivalent to the following uh, Klein Gordon equations. Uh, the nonlinearity is the same as uh, uh, equation two. Here, uh, D'Alembertian plus M squared, just Klein Gordon equation. And uh, d mu a mu is equal to zero. This is a Lorentz gauge condition. So, in fact, uh, the Lorentz gauge condition eight is satisfied for all times, if and only if the initial data. Oh, sorry. Initial data psi zero a nu b nu satisfy the following comp compatibility condition relevant to the Lorentz gauge. Uh, B0 plus DGAJ equal to zero, and Laplacian A0 minus uh, M squared times A0 plus one half I minus gamma five psi zero psi zero plus DJ BJ is equal to zero. So, if uh, the initial data sat satisfies uh, this uh, gauge compatibility,
susceptibility conditions, we have only to consider equation 7. This Klein Gordon equation, uh, instead of uh, the original Proca equation. So from now on, uh, we consider uh, this equation. This, uh, this form of uh, the Proca equation. So let me introduce some notation. Uh, for a Banach space x and a non-negative number k, uh, let small o sub x of m minus k and large o sub x of m2 minus k denote various terms of smaller order and of not larger order, respectively, than m2 minus k as m tends to infinity. And let capital U sub D of T denote the evolution operator of the free Dirac equation. So now, uh, let me mention uh, the main result. Theorem 1, let epsilon be any small positive constant. Assume initial data, psi 0, a nu, m, b, nu m. Here, uh, initial data of the Proca field uh, depends on parameter mass m. And initial data belongs to h1 plus epsilon cross h1 plus epsilon cross h1, h epsilon. And the gauge con compatibility conditions hold. And also the initial data uh, of the Proca field a new m, b new m satisfy uh, this uh, decrease condition with respect to m. That is h1 plus epsilon norm of uh, a new m is small o of m to minus 1 and h epsilon norm of uh, b new m is small o of 1 as m infinity. Then there exists a positive constant, capital T, independent of mass m and the unique solutions. Psi and a nu of uh, the Dirac Proca equations, such that uh, psi belongs to C minus TT to H1 plus epsilon, a nu is in C minus TT to H1 plus epsilon. And uh, this uh, estimate, a priori estimate, C minus TT to H1 plus epsilon norm of psi uh, is large O of 1, and uh, C minus TT to H1 plus epsilon norm of A nu is small O of 1, as M tends to infinity. And the following approximation formula holds. Uh, Dirac field psi can be represented as a, this is a free Dirac e solution and uh, minus a, i over 4 times m squared integral from 0 to t of uh, cubic cubic nonlinearity of psi and uh, small o h epsilon of inverse squared m, uniformly on the interval minus t, 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 t as m tends to infinity. So uh, I'd like to mention a couple of remarks of this theorem 1. The first remark is the approximation formula 14, this formula, may be thought of as the four fermion interaction approximation of the intermediate vector boson model at low energy. The coefficient before the integral on the right hand side of 14, that is uh, modulus of this number, 
is called a uh, Fermi constant. And the, this Fermi constant is uh, known that uh, it has dimensions of inverse squared mass. So uh, approximation formula 14 agrees with this physical observation because here uh, in the denominator uh, in uh, yeah, squared mass is here. So this uh, approximation form uh, yeah, no no sorry theorem one implies that the solutions psi and m converge to free Dirac solution and trivial solution zero of Prokaba. Yes. In the first equation in the Dirac in the system, in the system there appears some term like mu in the nonlinearity. Oh uh, yes. So but the a and you uh, still remain uh, this sum. Oh, yes. So it's a high yeah. Order. So this is uh, maybe this is a zero order free solution. Uh, the first yes in the first order uh, there's no any right. So uh, again, uh, I would say theorem one uh, implies that the solution. Uh, Dirac Proca equations converge to the free Dirac solution and trivial uh, of tri trivial solution of Proca field as m tends to infinity. So this implies four fermions get to have almost no interaction with each other as the mass of intermediate vector boson increases. So uh, this is the reason why the weak interaction is so weak at low energy. So this explanation is also written in, in the introductory book of elementary particles. So uh, second remark is uh, assumption 11. Assumption 11 is a decay condition on it. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. Yes. <coughs> Assumption 11 is the decay condition of initial data with respect to M. So at first sight, this condition looks strange, but this seems to be natural because in the physics context, it, it is always assumed that the kinetic energy part uh, D'Alembertian NU is much smaller than the less energy part M squared NU at low energy. So th this end equation seven is a uh, Klein-Gordon uh, equation. Yes. So <laughs> at low energy, this part is smaller than mass sums. And if uh, Dirac fields have the size of one, which independent of capital M, so if uh, as M tends to infinity, uh, NU uh, decays to zero, right? So that implies the initial data of NU decays as M increases. In that sense, uh, the decay condition on initial data 11 is natural. Yes, this condition. Yes, and this and what I already told you suggests that if the solution psi of the Dirac equation has the size independent of M, then any should be larger of uh, inverse squared M. And D sub T squared N at equal zero should be larger of one as M tends to infinity. 
which also require C together with interpolation that uh, BIMI. BIMI is uh, uh, the first derivative in time variable of N should be larger of M to minus 1. The third remark is, uh, yes, in order to show the existence time T is independent of mass M, in theorem 1, actually we have only to assume the following weaker condition than uh, 11. So in the 11, uh, this power is minus 1. But uh, as far as the local existence time, uh, as far as a uh, local existence theorem with existence time t independent of m is concerned, uh, we need only this quantity is larger of m to minus one half. So, actually, uh, assumption 11 uh, ensures uh, the approximation formula 14. Now let me briefly explain how to prove theorem 1. The proof consists of two parts. One is to show the local existence of solutions with existence time t independent of mass m. Another is uh, uh, to prove the approximation formula 14. So sketch of proof for the local existence part. Proof uh, the local existence of solutions with uh, existence time t independent of mass m. So for that purpose, all that we have to do is to see how the strict assessment depends on mass m for the Klein-Gold equation with mass m. So uh, I'd, let me explain uh, strict assessment. So, uh, lemma one, m is a non-negative constant. Uh, this is a parameter. And u satisfies uh, the following klein gordon equation with the external forcing term capital F and uh, in initial condition u and d sub t u at equal zero equal to u not u1 and over x in rd d dimensional euclidean space in this is q r and uh, q tilde r tilde uh, satisfies uh, these Relations, but you don't have to uh, memorize these relations. <laughs> so, uh, indices Q R and uh, Q tilde R tilde satisfying these relations are called uh, uh, admissible pair of the strict assessment. So then, the L Q zero T to L R over Rd norm of u is bounded by some constant times uh, the L2 norm of uh, angle brackets nabla sub m gamma plus uh, the L2 norm of uh, angle brackets nabla sub m to gamma minus one. Uh, angle brackets sub m denotes the inverse Fourier transformation, the square root of uh, modulus of square plus m square Fourier transformation. So this is the standard notation. Plus uh, L Q tilde uh, prime zero T to L R tilde prime norm of F. So prime, uh, prime denotes the Helder conjugator. Yes. 
So, uh, I'd like to mention the remark about the three cut estimate. So, when special dimension D are uh, equal to three, we can not choose R equal to D. Uh, this case is called the end point. Is it because wave equation? Pardon? Is it that because the equation is wave? Yes, uh, but that's for the also the Klein Gordon equation, this this is the end point. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is pointed out by Klein and Marketon. So however, if we choose gamma equal to one and r equal to 6 over epsilon, epsilon is any positive number, lemma 1 and Sobolev embedding yield uh, this inequality. The point is uh, uh, here we can choose uh, L infinity norm, but this is just uh, the Sobolev embedding. Uh, instead of choosing this index infinity, uh, we lose some regularity, epsilon. Here, angle brackets nabla uh, denotes this one, so M is replaced by just one, number one. Under the assumption 11, assumption 11 is that decreases condition on initial data with respect to M. All the terms on the right hand side of the above equality do not depend on mass m. So uh, dependence on mass m is harmless. So this inequality is used by uh, Ponce and Sidelis to prove the local well poseness for the Hosey problem of semilinear wave equation. So now let me explain how to prove this silica estimate. Uh, let capital N denote a dyadic number and let uh, capital P sub N be the resolved Perry operator. So put uh, angle brackets N sub M equal to, yes, here, uh, Guza is replaced by number N. So this is not operator. Just number. For that d dimensional case, uh, by the stationary phase method, we have the following frequency localized dispersive estimate. That is the L infinity norm over RD e, e to IT nabla sub M times PNF is bounded by some constant times N times uh, angles and uh, sub m to d minus 1 over 2 and some time decay factor times the L1 norm of p and f. So he here uh, we note, yes, so this is, this is the same as the uh, mathless wave equation. So actually lemma 1 uh, is uh, independent of m. We note that when employ the so-called TT star argument or the duality argument, the operator we need to estimate is not EIT nabla sub M, but EIT nabla sub M over nabla sub M squared. We actually need to estimate this operator. So summing up the above inequalities over N, and interpolating between the resulting inequality and the L2 isometry of this operator, we have this inequality. LP norm of uh, EIT nabla M over nabla M squared F is bounded by some constant times uh, decay factor times, uh, yes, this quantity. 
P, uh, P prime denotes a Hilda conjugate of P. So this factor uh, is this factor depends on M, so it might cause problem as M tends to infinity. <laughs> but uh, here we note uh, this this power minus two plus theta d plus one over d minus one is negative for d rather than y equal to three. So this factor is harmless because uh, the power is negative. Yes. Uh, the right hand side of this inequality is bounded as m to infinity for the re reason I stated. Lemma 1 follows from uh, the argument by, standard argument by Brenner, Peschel, Geneva, Rubero, and Kirtao. So once we have the strict assessment, the proof of local existence is standard. So for example, uh, Ponce Sideris for semi-linear wave equations and Escobedo Vega for non-linear Dirac equations. So I'd like to mention a couple of remarks. Uh, the local existence part. Uh, the Dirac Proca equation and uh, the Maxwell Dirac equations have the energy conservation. The energy functional is uh, defined as uh, the integral of uh, gam gamma j times dj psi i gamma zero psi plus one half f mu nu times f mu nu plus m squared a mu a nu. So this is the energy. So here uh, capital D mu is so called the covariant derivative and f mu nu is defined as d mu a nu minus d mu a, a mu. So the energy space is uh, h1 half cross h1 cross l2 and the scaling critical space is the l2 cross h1 half cross h minus 1 half. So please keep this fact in your mind. So when we consider a uh, gauge equation such as uh, the Maxwell Dirac equations, the choice of gauge plays a crucial role. For example, in 1994, Kleinerman Macedon showed the cosy problem of Maxwell Klein-Gordon equations under the Coulomb gauge dj aj equal to zero. It's uh, time locally well pose h1 cross l2 cross H1 cross L2. Uh, Max Klein Gordon equation has a positive definite energy function. So, this uh, local well posedness and uh, the energy conservation implies global existence of solution. Uh, they found uh, the Coulomb gauge is the null form estimate. This is a new ingredient of their proof. In 1996, uh, Bruno Vers showed uh, the Cauchy problem of Maxwell-Dirac equations under both Lorentz and uh, Coulomb gauge conditions is locally well posed in space HS cross HS plus one half cross HS minus one half for S uh, larger than one half. So this space is nearly energy space. His proof uh, is based on the energy estimate and the strict estimate. He doesn't use a uh, null form estimate. So after that, Masmudi and Nakanishi in 2003 uh, showed the cosy problem of Maxwell-Dirac equations is locally well posed in the energy space under the Coulomb gauge. They make 
a clever use of uh, uh, strict assessment and uh, the null form estimate. So uh, unfortunately, even when they proved uh, the local well poisonous in the energy space, uh, they could not prove the global existence because the energy is not positive definite for Dirac equations. So the global existence in energy space of solutions for the Maxwell Dirac equation is still open. Recently in 2010, uh, Dancona, Foshi, and Selbach proved uh, the Cauchy problem of Maxwell Dirac equations under the Lorentz gauge is t time locally well posed in space, HS times HS plus one half cross HS minus one half for NES positive. This space is uh, nearly scaling critical, nearly scaling critical space. So this is nice results, but uh, they do not solve the equations with respect to gauge potential anew, <coughs> but solve the equations with respect to Dirac field, Psi, and electromagnetic fields, E and B, by using uh, the freedom of gauge. So they found uh, new null forms, uh, which they called uh, system null forms. Here, uh, Elect electronic field E is defined as nabla N0 minus D0 A and uh, magnetic field B is defined as nabla times A. A is a vector, uh, special vector of A1, A2, A3. So they, they didn't solve uh, potential gauge potential equation. But anyway, they, their results are very nice. So next, uh, let me proceed to the sketch of proof for uh, approximation formula 14. <coughs> the cosy problem of the Dirac Proca equations uh, can be written as follows. Uh, this is the regular equation associated with uh, the Dirac equation for the uh, Dirac Proca equations. Right. And next, uh, this equation is uh, the integral equation associated with the Proca equation. So the proof. It's easy. Uh, the argument is yes. The approximation of uh, integration by path to the integral on the right hand side of 17, that is this. So we use integration by path for this integral. Then uh, we have the following identity. So A nu uh, is represented as, uh, this is free part, linear part, plus uh, one over uh, twice uh, angle brackets nabla sub m squared, gamma zero times gamma mu i minus gamma phi psi psi. And uh, minus, uh, yes, the less Yes, so this, this term corresponds to uh, the cubic, oh no, sorry. Fine. Yes, that term corresponds to this uh, term, right? That is the Fermi formula. Mm. 
Yes. So here uh, the Fermi approximation is, and uh, the rest is uh, smaller order because uh, here uh, here are uh, one more oscillation factors, right? So Fermi inserts the right hand side of 18 into 16, that is, yes, 18, these factor, these sums, into, yes, inside of this integral, here, The third term on the right hand side corresponds to the uh, second ta term, that is the Fermi approximation on the right hand side of 14. And the less terms on the right hand side of 18 can be regarded as smaller order terms than uh, inverse squared m as m tends to infinity. This is because the fourth and the fifth terms on the right hand side of 18 include rapid oscillation factors. So this term. Because uh, this factor, this factor depends on M. So this dependence of, on M uh, yields extra decay with respect to M. Oh, sorry. Yes. Furthermore, the assumption 11. Assumption 11 uh, is uh, uh, the decreased condition on initial data with respect to capital M implies that the time integral of the first and the second term, that is a, a linear part, is a small O a sub H epsilon of inverse squared M as M tends to infinity. So uh, we can have an uh, approximation formula, 14. So now uh, let me mention a remark about uh, regularity assumption on initial data. So remark 5. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a mistake. <laughs> Twice it appears. So it is assumed that uh, initial data of uh, the Dirac field is in H1 plus epsilon in theorem But the following weaker assumption on the regularity of initial data is sufficient for the local existence of solution. Uh, the difference is here. Uh, weaker, this weaker assumption is sufficient for local existence independent of uh, mass M. So I guess uh, we would be able to have theorem 1 uh, this weaker assumption probably but uh, so far I have not succeeded because uh, I have not succeeded using a null form estimate so far uh, thank you for your attention. Come, Samuel.